in different media and everything. And then there's one project that I would like to go into a little bit deeper uh, to show you some of the practical issues that you run into when dealing with uh, visualization. So um, the first project um, is <coughs> a transition card or transitional map. Uh, and here the data set is a database of uh, vacant places by the local government. They keep a record of all the buildings that are not being used. Um, we took that and we combined it with uh, historical cartographic layers and we combined them into an installation where people who are looking for a space in the city, for example, an artist or someone who wants to operate a small shop in a, using that is not being, in a building that is not being used, uh, they can use this map to, uh, to get an overview of what buildings are available in the city and uh, compare that to historic maps to see if, it, if they can uh, embed it into the history of the place. So for example, if you go into this area where there used to be uh, some, some, some farming, you could go and use it to do something that um, has maybe an uh, agricultural uh, reference or trying to uh, make things fit in that uh, way. So this is an example of using cartographic data, something that you will see a lot when dealing with um, data visualization. Um, something that is also cartographic but has much more uh, connections with people on a personal level is a project where the data set was uh, a large collection of photographs of personal memories and artifacts uh, of people in this neighborhood in Delft and we made that into a website that um, allows you to uh, browse all these pictures and they're organized uh, thematically and you can uh, they're organized also around the location of where these people live so you can um, basically look into their private lives all their old pictures and all their old toys and record covers everything is in there and you can look at it from a, a cartographic or a temporal view like here um, really allows you to, uh, to, to get, an, get an idea and uh, sort of look beyond, behind people's front doors, uh, so to speak. In this case, we also put these, uh, these permanent uh, signs in the neighborhood that uh, reference uh, the map to a physical point in the neighborhood and also try to establish a relation between uh, the physical and the virtual uh, and allowing people to be... Um, <coughs> engaged by this, by this project even when they're just walking down the street. And then we made, of course, uh, an iPhone app so you can walk this, uh, this tour that we organized and while you walk the street you get to see these, um, these pictures of people living there. Um, a completely different media is for a project that was commissioned by the Dutch Ministry of Finance to design uh, a coin uh, commemorating um, 50 years of World Nature Foundation. This was a, a sort of um, contest among a couple of designers to come up with uh, ideas about that. And of course, I was trying to use uh, a data set and data visualization to, um, to use in a coin, which is a really interesting project because you would think about data uh, visualization at a completely different level and scale. This is uh, a five euro coin, it's about uh, two or three centimeters uh, in, uh, in width and you have, to, you have to work with a relief of about uh, half a millimeter. So um, this was for me an interesting experiment to see how you can use data visualization on a completely different medium than you would usually uh, look at it. Um, <coughs> last example before I go a little bit more in depth is a cartographic simulation for an Eichwaterstaat and I wanted to show this because it is it uses an entire space uh, comprised of I think uh, 20 or 30 HD projectors uh, on both the floor and the walls um, to have meetings and, and uh, discussions about uh, all kinds of infrastructural uh, projects <coughs> and using data visualization uh, to do that. Um, so the, the project that I want to look at a little bit more in depth is the most ambitious so far, which is visualizing a backup of the internet. Um, it's based around um, GeoCities, and I'm not sure if 
anyone here is familiar with GeoCities. Uh, GeoCities is a kind of web hosting provider from the 1990s. And for me, when I first got on the internet, I think it was around 1995, uh, people explained to me the internet by using a lot of metaphors. They said it would be a kind of digital city or digital library or kind of utopian uh, ideas of that. And so when I finally did get online, I was a little bit disappointed that the internet in fact looked like this and not like a digital city or a digital library. It was kind of um, chaotic and, and uh, people would often say it's, it's kind of ugly, the early internet. This is a typical page from 1995. You would see <laughs> repeating backgrounds, animated GIFs under construction banners. Um, for those of you who were using the internet around that time, this would be very familiar. Um, People would use various ways of telling you that their page was under a sort of never-ending construction. Um, but what happened with this, uh, with this GeoCities um, uh, website is that it got <laughs> bought by uh, Yahoo in 1999 for three and a half billion dollars because at this point it was a very famous website and it was used by 35 million people. And around 1999 it was a third of the internet. So GeoCities comprised a third of the internet in terms of traffic. So it was a very uh, large portion of it. And what happened after Yahoo bought this website, because they thought they were going to make a lot of money off of it, uh, is that people started to move on. So instead of using uh, GeoCities, where you would have a home page and it would be organized in, um, in neighborhoods, that was the, the whole idea of GeoCities. So you would, be, you would have a home page about... Um, I don't know about farming, and it would be in this neighborhood called, called uh, the Heartland. So it was organized by subject, and then um, organized in this kind of <laughs> metaphorical idea of a city. Um, but it got bought, and uh, just after it was bought, people started to move on to like Facebook and MySpace and Friendster. And what Yahoo ended up with was basically a digital ghost town that they had bought for three and a half billion dollar, where everybody had left. So um, in 2009, 10 years after the <coughs> sale, they decided to delete it uh, because keeping the servers up was apparently too costly for them, uh, even though it was probably only a few hundred dollars in hosting uh, costs a year, but still they deleted it. And of course, this is very problematic because the GeoCities was such a large part of the internet in the 1990s that basically everything people did in this period was put on GeoCities and was now gone. For example, a lot of Wikipedia pages, they still refer to GeoCities and you would end up at this page saying, sorry, we have closed and everything is gone. So, what happened? Uh, just before they shut it down, there was, I think, a kind of heroic uh, effort by a group of hackers uh, called the Archive Team. This is a loosely organized group of hackers around the world who um, decided to try and make a backup of this GeoCities page before they were shutting it down. They gave a warning, I think, two weeks in advance. Um, so um, they succeeded largely in that, and they ended up with uh, about 650 gigabyte uh, backup file that they put online as a BitTorrent file. Um, and I downloaded this file took about six months because not many people are uh, seeding this kind of file, of course. Uh, but once I did, I successfully downloaded it and I had on my desk a hard drive containing a third of the internet in 1999, which is a very interesting uh, idea for me as an uh, information designer that you would uh, sort of uh, physically uh, have something like that um, on your desk. So this file, this digital data file for me was uh, what I, call, what I call the digital Pompeii, or the sort of starting point for this uh, digital archaeology. Um, and I made it into a map of GeoCities that is uh, accessible as a digital installation uh, where you can uh, visit, so to speak, this deleted city. And I have uh, a video of uh, this installation that kind of explains uh, what it does. Although I don't have sound, which is a shame, but a very nice song. Another thing that people would do in, uh, in these, these home pages was uh, they would use uh, MIDI files, uh, a kind of simple 
uh, note-oriented music uh, files in their home page, so you would hear a lot of uh, music while browsing it. And when you use this installation, if there's a MIDI file around you somewhere, it will start playing. So you have this constant uh, musical entourage of bleepy uh, versions of 90s music. And the idea behind this is that you can, uh, it's kind of like Google Maps, so you can zoom out and you have this view of the city in its entirety. And it functions as a kind of data visualization of the city where you can compare these neighborhoods in size. For example, the heartland is very big and a neighborhood about uh, fashion uh, is, is smaller, so you get an idea of how they, they all relate. Uh, but from this overview as a data visualization, you can actually zoom in down, down all the way to uh, the smallest uh, animated GIF inside some uh, individual homepage. So this, yeah, this video kind of explains the idea again. It's basically what I just told. But if I would just shortly elaborate on, on um, the reasons for me to make this, this installation, it's first of all because as an information designer I think it was a very interesting uh, technical challenge. Uh, if, if, if it is possible these days to have these kind of enormous backup files and someone puts it online and basically just says, here it is, we don't know why you should want it or who should need this, but we decided that it was important to back it up. I thought it was an interesting case uh, as a designer to see if you can actually do something with that and if you can um, transform this, this digital data file into something that is visible and uh, allows people to, to engage with the subject. And secondly, I think it's very interesting when you look at this kind of time capsule um, of the internet 15 years ago, um, I think it's very interesting to, co to, to see it as a kind of mirror and compare it to how we are using uh, the internet as a medium today and see some really interesting uh, differences <coughs> in the metaphors that are used on what the internet is and how you should use it from being a kind of library that you should contribute to in the 90s. They also had the term like netizens, the citizens of the net. That there was a whole kind of pretty utopian um, uh, context around this and pretty adventurous. Things were in a constant flux. Um, and I think by showing this again, by revisiting this 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 digital city, it's it's interesting to look at how things have changed now that the medium has become much more mature and much more user friendly and much more pleasing to look at. Uh, I think the internet has also become a much more consumptive medium where the role of people using it is much more that of a user instead of the netizen that it would maybe have been uh, in the 1990s, so um, that was an interesting reason for me to um, to try and and, um, and use this file as a starting point for my project. Um, so yeah, this is this is basically uh, a rough overview of um, how I try to to deal with with digital archives and digital files and different ways of uh, visualizing them. Sometimes interactive, sometimes not. Uh, I think my approach is, is, is fairly experimental. I think there are uh, designers who are uh, much more specialized in, for example, uh, visualizing statistical data sets or making newspaper uh, visualizations of statistical data. Uh, this is a bit more uh, uh, broad, I guess, um, but I hope it, it, it gives you an impression of um, where you can go with this, uh, this, this discipline or emerging trait that I think it is. So, thanks. Yeah, thanks. You're welcome. <laughs> All right.